Hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. Um, welcome to this week's In the Artist Studio. I'm Elena Gross, the Exhibitions Associate at MOAD. And it's my pleasure today to be speaking and touring in virtual space with San Francisco-based artist Rodney Ewing. Um, before we get to the conversation, I just want to get through a few housekeeping items. Um, once again, for all of our audience members who are just now joining us, please write in and tell us where you're joining us from in the chat. Um, but MOAD's physical building may be closed due to the mandatory shelter in place, but you can still get your fill of art and artists of the African diaspora. Each Wednesday at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, join MOAD staff members as we visit some of our favorite artists in their studios to see what they're currently working on and how their work is changing as a result of the quarantine. This is a rare opportunity to hear from artists directly from their studios. We follow all of the talks with an audience Q&A, so please feel free um, at any time during uh, the conversation today to leave your questions in either the chat box or the Q&A box, and we'll address them live um, towards the end of the program. Uh, Rodney and I will talk probably, probably for about 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll open it up, or uh, 30 to 45 minutes, and then we'll open it up for um, audience Q&A. Um, and please visit our website to see which artists we have coming up um, it's going to be a nice, uh, there's quite a nice lineup um, for the next few weeks. Um, you can also go back and watch all of our past talks on the MOAD YouTube channel. This series was made possible by generous donations from the Westridge Foundation, our wonderful, our wonderful MOAD members, and viewers like you. Thank you for all for your continued support of all of the programming that we've been doing um, over the last few months. Um, I also want to uh, address um, to make a few uh, an, uh, acknowledgements. Um, the first is MOAD stands in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. We honor and mourn the senseless murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Tony McDade, and so many others who have lost their lives at the hands of police brutality and racial injustice, including those whose names we do not know. And these will come up again later today um, in this program. So remember those names and think on that um, as we move forward. Um, I would also like to give a land acknowledgement. Um, most of us are settler immigrants or descendants of those forcefully brought to this continent. Our institutions were founded upon exclusions and erasures of the indigenous peoples whose land we are located. With deep respect, MOAD acknowledges that even in virtual space, our people, our work, and our network servers are on native lands, and we thank the indigenous people of the Bay Area who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. Um, lastly, if you've been enjoying this series or any MOAD programming, please consider donating to MOAD online. Um, donations of any amount are always welcome, and there will be a link in the chat to where you can donate specifically. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to today's featured artist, Rodney Ewing. Um, Rodney is based in San Francisco, California, and is a visual artist. Um, Ewing's drawings, installations, and mixed media works focus on his need to intersect body and place, memory and fact to re-examine human histories, cultural conditions and events. With his work, he is pursuing a narrative that requires us to present, to be present and intimate. His work has been exhibited at Euphrat Museum of Art Cupertino, the Drawing Center New York, and in San Francisco at Root Division, Jack Fisher Gallery, Museum of the African Diaspora, Nancy Toomey Fine Art, Alter Space Gallery, Southern Exposure Gallery, and ICTUS projects. He has been an artist in residence at Recology and the DeYoung Museum of Fine Arts, both in, San both in San Francisco, as well as Jirasi in Woodside, California, Hetland Center for the Arts in Marin, California, and Bemis Center for the Arts in Omaha, Nebraska. Ewing received his BFA in printmaking from Louisiana State University and his MFA in printmaking from West Virginia University. Welcome, Rodney. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Of course. Um, it's great to see you. You as well. It's been, it's been a long time, which is funny because I feel like we ran into each other quite often at different events um, yeah. before all of this. Yeah. Yeah. And now it's like, um, I was, uh, somebody dropped off a piece of equipment to me the other day and I've only seen them, I haven't seen them like in person for a while. And it's like, when she dropped it off, like I got kind of emotional. It's like, I, you, you exist outside of a rectangle. Ah, the, the urge to, like the urge to hug people, people I would never have hugged before in life <laughs> is like so strong. And I have to like resist. I have to like pull yeah. myself back. It's just yeah. so this whole thing has been, has been quite the experience. Yeah, um, absolutely. 
what is what is shelter in place been like for you um like it just in general in terms of um not only that kind of distance between you know your larger networks of community you know your larger communities but also for your making and personal life um it's been um it's been exhausting um because i was in the middle probably the last part of my school year so march so we only had like uh like three months left for, for school um with a spring break tossed in there um so yeah trying to keep up with that transition and then sort of figure everything else out like you know studio practice and like you know how do i navigate my neighborhood now like you know it's probably like everybody else like where do i grocery shop you know where can i do that safely and um and then um it was it was also uh, heartening to see people um, sort of, you know, use technology to reach out to each other. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm part of a couple different collectives and, um, you know, using that to uh, connect with each other and stay in touch and um, probably getting more email and more text than I have ever, just because that's just the way people have to communicate now. Um, and, uh, and just some folks that I was with at the Headlands last year, you know, us reaching out and staying in touch. We were staying in touch anyway, but um, it's become, uh, I think it's become more of a priority, like yeah. trying to set those dates, trying to set those times and trying to check in with people, you know, however frequently that you that you can. Um, but yeah, it was, you know, that uh, as we were just talking before uh, we, we went live, it was, it was that first two weeks, like I, I had just been done in Baton Rouge. I had to, my mother's elderly, so I had to move her to, uh, from an independent living situation to an assisted living situation. And I did all that, like, right when the shelter in place was, was, was coming down. And so I, like, I couldn't even walk her into her, mm -hmm. her new home because they weren't allowing anybody in. So dropping off furniture for her and, and supplies outside so they could bring them in and then coming back home and just, I think all of, all of that between with the pandemic and that sort of like emotionally sort of, sort of caught me off guard. And it was like, there was probably like a day before I had to go back to work where I just like, I just sort of checked out. Yeah. And with you being, you know, you mentioned um, your school year, but for, I guess for anyone who doesn't know you being a school teacher, how has it been balancing being an educator right now, as well as being a practicing artist? Um, what has that, I don't think we've gotten to talk to many people who are currently in the process of like, well, outside of college space, but like currently mm -hmm. doing this kind of distance teaching and what distance learning looks like um, for, for younger kids. What has that been, been like for you? Um, it's been kind of anxious um, because, you know, all schools are different and everybody has their different priorities and they're trying to, everybody's trying to figure out um, like what's the what's the best practice for you know for the faculty and staff and for the students and um before we took the break um i i felt like the transition was pretty um i mean there were some hiccups but it wasn't anything that was insurmountable i felt like uh, a lot of my students showed up um and it was just a matter of um like adjusting my schedule and their schedule so i can get the the, the best quality time with them. So at one point I had a class of 22 and I was like, no, that doesn't, you know, the first week I did that, like, no, that's not going to work. Um, so I sort of breaking it down in, into sections of 12 and where I could have um, more one-on-one -on -one conversations with them, um, smaller groups. And it, they, they were more able to, they were uh, more prepared to speak in a smaller group. Um, and yeah, and just using technology a lot, um, you know, they had to start making a, uh, once a week, I had to start making demos via Zoom that I would upload into their Padlet so they could watch. Yeah. Um, and uh, has that affected I, your desire to? Is that part of your desire to learn the entire Adobe Suite? Is like now being so yeah like everything being so digital and so online. And yeah, adapting to that that kind yeah. of world. Absolutely, and then I'm really jealous of my my, my friend and coworker Brian Herrick, who's like um, needs a Netflix show because his Zoom videos are always so good. They're always so well edited. And he's like, he goes into character and has his backgrounds. And it's just like, 
and, you know, he edits things really well. And it's like, I, I want to do that, but I don't, I, you know, I don't, I don't have time. So, yeah. so I, I keep it, I keep it pretty straightforward and hopefully I can bring some of those, um, those higher quality production values and those more uh, bells and whistles to, uh, to my productions as, as we go on during the school year. Have you, did you have any upcoming, do you have any shows or ex, any exhibitions or residencies, um, anything that was upcoming, upcoming that has either been canceled or pushed back or anything you want to plug before we kind of dive in? Uh, yeah, I was part of the, or I still, I still was part of the um, Come to Your Census at YBCA. And um, like a lot of institutions, they pivoted so quickly and so, uh, so graciously, um, keeping all the artists involved because um, with because my part of that project was going to be at YBCA, um, you know, uh, asking people to fingerprint themselves and write their stories mm -hmm. and, um, you know, and they, we did all this prep work for it and then couldn't do it. So they switched these series of interviews and um, from the staff that they, they posted, which was which was really great. Um, and also, um, there's a new residency in the dog patch called the space program. Mm -hmm. um, it's on 18th in Tennessee. And um, yeah, um, yeah. Erica Demon um, was at one of the first uh, meetings when they opened the space as well. So, but um, yeah, one of my friends that I was in an exhibition with, I met a long time ago, Tahiti Pearson, um, ended up um, coming to that uh, to that program for that for that event, and we immediately said like, yeah, let's. We've been talking forever, like um, like let's let's do a collaboration piece. So we were able to. Um, we talk about the collaboration and we're both going to be there in April and like um, he does these these beautifully cut uh, pattern pieces on 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 um, on paper and on canvas. Yeah, I and actually I actually want to show some. I think this is a great segue into yeah. talking about that work. Um, mm -hmm. Just give me one moment. Mm -hmm. I pull this up. Yeah. And so yeah, we were supposed to be in space program for, you know, you know, about a month, um, working side by side with, um, you know, on these, on these pieces together. And then, you know, the shelter in place it. And so, you know, physically we couldn't, we couldn't be together. So, um, Jed Bergeron, one of the, one of the principals and, uh, Emily Lakin, another one of the principals there, um, really just sort of kept this rolling and just said like, you know, can we do this by mail? And, oh, wow. Uh, and so Tahiti would cut things. Uh, he would cut, like, this is one of the first pieces we collaborate on. So he did all these, these really interesting, intricate cuts and, you know, rolled them up and, and UPS them to me. Wow. And, uh, and, and then, so, I, then, so you don't, do you communicate ahead of time as to what the cuts are going, you know, like what no. about the design or is it, so every time it's a surprise and it's yeah, every time it's a surprise. And it's like, you know, I told somebody like every, you know, every time he sends me something, it's like Christmas, you know, <laughs> it's like, yeah. what am I going to get today? I and imagine. Um, and um, yeah, so he's been sending me a combination of, uh, pay, you know, um, cut paper and uh, he's been silk screening. Um, he's been silk screening as well. Um, so that's that's this one that here. There's actually two sheets of paper. Then I've been he did this before. He, he did another one where he, it was actually two separate sheets of paper. And I looked at him and was like, oh, these need to be these need to be connected. So I you know I flipped them over and connected them on the back and then silk screen over the top of them. So it's kind of like an exquisite corpse a little bit in terms of you know. Yeah, very much so. And then you know I'll take a photograph of it and send it back to him and like oh this is what I just came up with and. So we see we're up to see two, four, six. I think we're up to like about eight pieces by now. Wow. How how long do you how long is the residency for? How long is it gonna continue? Um, I think he's I think he says he's gonna send me another one soon. So um yeah, we'll you know, until he stops sending me stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So this um, could be a, this could be like a like a long like an ongoing project potentially. And then uh, then Judd Bergeron, who he, he shows with uh, Nancy Toomey, approached her. It's like you know, yeah, can we do a show here? And you know, in twenty twenty one, and she's like very graciously said, yeah. And so space the space program, they're going to frame all the work, and um, yeah, it's been. You know, and I was, you know, not only, you know, doing my own practice, sort of like 
pulled me along doing this whole thing, but also, um, you know, when somebody sends you work in there, mm -hmm. you know, Tahiti is sending me a gift. Like this is yeah. the way I look at it is like, you know, okay, so we, we, what are you going to do with this? What can you do with this? And yeah. And that sort of keeps me present. You know, that's one yeah. of the things that's been keeping me present. How do you, so, um, so you're part of, uh, your part of the collaboration then I'm assuming is the is the, is the creation of the prints on top of the paper. Yeah. yeah. Um, how do you decide what, how do you decide to match the works that you end up printing with the cuts that he does? Like, what is that process like? Um, you know, first of all, you know, I'll address like just physical size, like what can fit on the mm -hmm. space. And then, um, once I narrow that down, I'll start looking at what combinations of screens, because I have a, a large assortment of silk screens here that I've, I've used for other individual projects or group projects that, that I'd never tend to have in combination together. So, um, so it's almost an extension of the, we'll talk about later, the shelter in place work that I've been doing, mm -hmm. sort of taking these different elements, um, some of them um, very um, disparate references and putting them together and, and having a conversation. And then, you know, uh, this piece, the one of John Coltrane, it's, it's on the screen right now. And there was another one of James Baldwin. I just I felt like they, they felt like very, almost like almost stained glass to me. Yeah. You know, and like, who, you know, I started just thinking, kicking around that idea, like, who are my saints right now? Who, you know, mm. I, I was probably listening to some Coltrane at the time. Um, and then, uh, you know, with the, you know, with, the, with all the, the unrest going on, um, in a country right now, like I, I felt like I needed some James Baldwin. Yeah, I love that you mentioned that it looks like the the idea, the reference of stained glass, and this idea of sainthood, um, because I think one of the things that's so beautiful about these pieces are the spaces where the color, where the the light comes through in between, and you can really see the textural nature of the paper, and you can really see the cuts, and it fe that feels like such a special kind of way of visualizing this relationship that you now have with this other artist and, and this your your means of um, communicating with one another. Um, like those spaces feel like almost pauses in a conversation in certain ways. Um, yeah. It, yeah, there's like a sense of, I don't know, there's a sense of a really nice dialogue between the two of you. Um, and mm -hmm. it's funny that it all happens via mail. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I have, he doesn't preview them like, oh, I'm going to send you this. He just, you know, just tells me like, yeah, just put something in mail, you know, and my job is to, you know, look look out for it and bring it up to my studio. And I, I, I think the first two were kind of intimidating because I, I think they sat in here for like a week and I just like, they sat in a tube for a couple of days. Like I didn't even want to open them up and then finally opened them up and then it's like, wow, this is gorgeous. Yeah. And then, How like, big is this one? This one is maybe 18 by 24. Wow. So yeah, they're quite sizable too. Yeah. That yeah. is a precious gift to then have to, you know, very carefully unroll <laughs> and, and you don't, you only get one, you don't get, you know? Yeah, there's, there's no eraser with this one. <laughs> right, exactly. Wow. Well, thank you for showing us these. Oh, no problem. Um, so yeah, let's uh, maybe then pivot to talking about your shelter in place series. Um, obviously, uh, based on you know your website and how many pieces you've you've made across this period of time, can you talk a little bit about one how um, how you kind of got started? Obviously, it's you know for all of us, but then also what you were mentioning before in terms of the first few weeks of the pandemic. Just I feel like everyone's kind of in a everyone's just trying to grapple with this new reality and figure out what any of this means or what any of this, like, um, like what any of us are going to do basically going forward. And so how did you, I guess, start making again? How did you switch into gears to start this series? And did you know it was going to be a series when you start making, um, when you started making the prints and I'll show them in just a second, but. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, before you know before we went live you know where I was talking to you about like um, like my first two weeks of of the pandemic of the shelter in place were um, were kind of emotionally kind of rough like I said I had just moved my mom I 
you know, taking a flight from, I, I went down there for three days and immediately came back. Um, you know, I got back to San Francisco, like on a Friday night, early Saturday morning, um, slept that whole time. And then also realized like, okay, Monday, you know, is work. I got to go to work on Monday and I have to go to this new environment where everything's uh, on a computer screen and, and adapting to all this. And, um, and I think I was just, for lack of a better word, I was being really, really, really gentle with myself. And like, mm. this, this is about the level I can do. I can come downstairs and I can, I can open my computer and I can, I can talk to my students for this amount of time. I can go to this faculty meeting, faculty meeting for this amount of time. And I can't do anything else. I don't, I didn't have the bandwidth to do anything else. Um, so I thought, and then I guess about towards that second week, I was like, okay, you need to, you need to transition. Um, uh, just physically, I needed to get out of the house um, and separate work life from and have a studio life. And I'm lucky. Um, my studio that I'm in, you know, where you're seeing right now, Specific Felt Factory, and um, it's about 800 feet from my front door. So, yeah. oh yeah, I forgot to ask. Uh, do, would you mind showing us, a, giving us a, a little, a little spin around your space? Sure. Sure, let me, uh, let me unhook myself. All right, so this is my space. Um, I have a TV because I like watching old movies while I work, um, except for Mel Brooks. I can't do it because he makes me laugh too much. <laughs> um, no blazing saddles, no young Frankenstein while right, I'm working. Exactly. Because I'll do I myself. Recognize a, that piece behind you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just had a studio visit uh, a couple of days ago, so uh, it's my studio right now is relatively clean. Um, it usually it's pretty chaotic. Um, yeah, and Pacific Felt Factory. I've been in here for six years. Um, um, my wife um, started this um, by tracking down the owner of this formerly empty building mm -hmm. that uh, runs perpendicular to uh, where we live and. She found them and convinced them to uh, uh, re reopen the studio. She loaned them the money for construction um, to build out the studios. And um, yeah, been here ever since. It's amazing. Yeah, and we're all playing probably below market rate for studios yeah. here. and uh, Which is so important, obviously, in San Francisco, especially. Yeah, 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 um, exactly. Because yeah, yeah, there's just not everybody's doing this, I mean, Mm -hmm. It would be nice if, it, if people had extra space someplace in a, a warehouse or a building that they're not using or storefront. Like, okay, let me give this to artists and let me have them occupy this and then be of use. But um, yeah, so it's, it's a real special place. So um, again, like I said, it's about 800 feet from door to door. Um, and yeah, I just realized that uh, for my teaching practice and for my art practice, I needed to move out of the house. And so yeah, I start getting up earlier in the morning, um, you know, prepping for school, you know, breakfast, you know, actually putting clothes on that did believe that, you know, didn't have drawstrings attached to them. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so I started teaching from here. And then I, you know, I had this idea about the shelter in place work as far as the medium. I knew I wanted to explore like all these, these different, um, elements of silk screen that I have here in my studio, all these different screens and using them in different ways to, um, to sort of extend this narrative about race and identity. Um, and while I was at a, at a residency of ecology, I found all these, uh, um, I was able to get all these, um, I got two uh, insur old insurance ledgers and that's what the background paper has been. So I, I really wanted to explore the idea of make, sort of making my own paper. Um, mm -hmm. um, because the sheets themselves, I think they're like 11 by 18. So I've been, I've been collaging these sheets of paper together, make different shapes, and then silk screening uh, different elements on top of them. So I knew that was a project that was already coming. And, you know, it was one of those things where I just sat down, well, why don't we just do this now and see where it goes. And then giving myself sort of a, a time restriction, like we're going to do a new piece every day and a half. Oh, wow. So all of these that you've done have taken, have, do you set like, almost like the eight hour day, like at, you know, at this time you have to be done with it and then do you walk away or do you come back to it? Um, like how rigid is your time restriction? 
Um, just because of the process, like I can, I can put all the paper together and then I can, you know, if I don't have anything else more pressing, I can put one image down. I can put, since the, this, the screens are done in layers, mm -hmm. I can put, I can put one image down, then it has, you know, it has to dry. Um, so then I'll come back maybe, you know, a couple hours later. And if there, if it's more than two screens or if it's like three screens or four screens, then I can put the next level down, the next color down. And, and in the case with this one, that's, uh, that's in front of, uh, that's being shown on the screen. Um, you know, I was able to come back and make the addition of like hand coloring uh, mm. some of the screens, some of the some of the work. So you mentioned where um, where you source the paper, um, but where are you sourcing your where are you sourcing the images that you are then laying down in the prints? Do you have are you spending just like hours a day with old magazines with old books? Um, how do you how do you find um, the images themselves? Um, yeah, like the images are from former projects. So um, with this one, the um, the soldiers and the girls that are that are um, that are sort of floating above them. That's one screen. It was from a project um, called Untether, Stories of the Fillmore, and um, so that was a body of work I did back in 2016. And it was a two-person exhibition with myself and uh, a friend of mine, Monica Lundy. She did a body of of paintings and I did this body of like these mixed media silk screens on paper and also on, um, on window frames. And so during our research, you know, we found, you know, uh, in the public library, we found all these, these, uh, these images from, you know, different time periods. Um, and I guess I should all say the, the whole project revolved around sort of the history displacement um, in mm -hmm. the Fillmore, Fillmore Western edition, where it used to be a Japanese neighborhood, Japanese American neighborhood. <clears throat> And then they were, they were, those citizens were placed into internment camps and then African-Americans moved in and lived there for maybe another 50 years. And then due to urban renewal and, uh, and you know, redlining policies, um, many of those, those citizens have moved out. So uh, I don't, there's not that many instances where those, uh, those histories intersect. And I, so I want to take that opportunity to do that in, in a visual format. Yeah. And so, what? yeah, so yeah, as far as the researching, it was like, mm -hmm. it was more just researching my own library of screens and images that I had from different projects. Mm -hmm. And revisiting them for, yeah. Mm -hmm. What, well, so I know that a part, as you mentioned, um, a big part of this project is thinking about uh, racial identity mm -hmm. in, um, and these different histories of specifically of, I think a lot of black American histories that, um, either remain untold or we have a complicated relationship to. Um, what has it been like, I guess, these past few months, given kind of our current, our current moment and a lot of the, um, the civic unrest around racial injustice and race, uh, racial violence, what has it been like kind of for you emotionally to be making these pieces at that same time? Um, how has, I mean, obviously we'll see in a few more of these pieces as we go on, but how have um, the current narratives in the news kind of started to, how have they interacted with um, with the work that you've been doing in this series and and the looking at the works that you've drawn from time and time again in all of these diff other series? Yeah, uh, I think this is probably the fastest I've ever responded to what's going on in um in the world usually um i think a number of factors it's usually because you know i you know i work eight hours a day um i usually have another project going on at the same time or um but with this one especially um you know seeing these things occur in front of you on tv uh i mean i i think you know you know hearing about brianna taylor and in hearing the details of the case and, or, you know, sitting there and seeing a face of that, that police officer, you know, killed George Floyd and, and, you know, what happened to Ahmaud Arbery, um, it's, you know, I kind of felt like I had no choice, mm. you know, in, in, in the most positive sense where I was able to, you know, I was captive. I was, I was here, I had these materials and I was able to respond to it. Um, and um, 
yeah, I guess there was some amount of catharsis to it, but at the same time, it was, you know, I was like many of us, I was grieving. It was yeah. like, like how many, how many times do we have to watch this? Right. You know, and, and it's like, uh, you know, we, you know, we've been shouting from the rooftops for, for centuries now um, about um, racial inequality in this country. And it's, and it seems like, um, you know, uh, private America and corporate America um, are finally, are finally getting it. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the situation in the White House, they don't get it, but um, they that will. Re that relationship <laughs> is really interesting too, that now that you mention it in terms of thinking about the paper and thinking about the insurance ledger, I think specifically, and sort of the, the complicity that obviously capitalism, mm -hmm. like this entire structure, um, the, the, the relationship between racism and capitalism, the relationship between um, the economic founding of this country and um, the, the Black people who were literal, who were th that economic, who were that original economic system, who provided that labor, who provided, um, yeah. kind of <clears throat> provided that capital um, has, is really interesting. Is that when you found, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming when you found the ledger, you didn't necessarily, or maybe you did, perhaps you did, uh, put those two things together. Is that a very, become, has that become a very intentional part of um, how you're building these works as well, is thinking about that relationship between capitalism and racism? It has been since I started this, this project back in April, like very, being very intentional about using, um, especially since uh, one of them I just like to just like the United United American Insurance Company, and mm -hmm. you know those well, those two words United and American mean different things for so many people in this country, mm -hmm. um, and some for some people don't you know it, it don't mean doesn't mean anything at all like in United America on, on based on whose values, right. um, so to, you know this, to have that be able to have that sort of that subtext that built in to um, to the medium and to the paper I'm working on. Uh, has been really interesting and then playing off of you know using images to sort of like play back and forth with mm -hmm. with that idea um and yeah also that you know addressing the idea of like um this this sort of capitalism built on pain where that capitalism could be built mm -hmm. on other factors like everybody could be doing well and sort of like prospering through this, this sort of this capitalist america that we, that we lived in but um, we, you know, this country seemed to, like they focus on the capitalism of pain. Like, you know, the only way I can make my money if somebody else doesn't have this doesn't have any money. The only way I can right. I can prosper if if I keep a Someone's certain suffering. yeah, if I, can, if I can keep a certain amount of people down. And it doesn't. And, and the studies have shown it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. These works are so. I mean. I can see how they are related to earlier projects that you've done, but they're, it, they definitely feel very timely, very urgent um, in response to this moment without being super direct. Um, and I think in all of your work, there's, you know, there's this very necessary, there are these through lines, um, these historical through lines, and they're very well researched. Um, I want to move, I guess, to, I'll move to a different body of work. Um, actually, I want to bring up one of the pieces that uh, we showed at MOAD actually just this past, well, not this past, in 2019, um, last, last spring, not this past spring, um, yeah. because I think it's had, conceptually, it's had quite a resurgence um, in kind of the popular imagination right now, both in terms of, um, in terms of the most recent season, uh, or I guess the only season that exists at the moment of HBO's The Watchmen, mm -hmm. and also Donald Trump's decision to host a one of his pro, his re-election kind of rallies in Tulsa, Oklahoma this past summer on the anniversary of Juneteenth. Um, it, so I'm going to let me pull that image up real quick. Hmm. So this is a conclave of smoke and memories, and we showed it um, when you, during your solo exhibition, um, Longitude and Latitude, um, at, via the Emerging Artists Program here at MOAD. 
And this was definitely, this was one of my favorite pieces. One, just, I think it's visually incredibly arresting, but then also thinking about how this particular history, the history of the bombing of Black Wall Street, um, how under, how, how we don't, how we talk about it, or rather how we haven't talked about it, um, hadn't talked about it enough. And then here are these two big moments within less than a year of this mm -hmm. exhibition. And it's suddenly, it's suddenly back in kind of public discourse. Um, and so I was just wondering, have you revisited this piece at all in, in the last year? And if so, um, what has that experience been like? Have you brought new thing, have new things come to light for you with this work and around um, that particular history in general? Yeah, I've been conceiving like a whole new piece. I mean, I've used that the, the schematic screen um, and some of the shelter in place images. Um, and that made me think about other geographic territories that were inhabited by black people in, in America that no longer exist and um, yeah, sort of trying to build a map that way, using these images and connecting them through um, in the sort of the same way. Um, but also, yeah, the, the, the idea, this, this sort of led me to, a, you know, the, a project I did at the Headlands um, last year you, um, where I was addressing the idea of um, how black people have always had to find different ways to navigate sort of these structures in America, whether it be so physical structures or social structures, even, even, you know, to the case of like psychological structures, how we, you know, how we internalize uh, so much of this trauma and, um, you know, how we have to deal with it as on an individual level and, you know, on a, on a family scale and also just, you know, on a, on a community level. Um, and yeah, start thinking about what, what's been missing. What's, um, again, what are these histories that uh, aren't being, are being talked about and, and how these, these disappearances, these, these erasures mm -hmm. sort of, sort of leave this, this traumatic legacy on where we are today. And, you know, there's that, you know, there's that old, um, argument like, well, I'll just move past to just get that happened in the past. But no, like what happened has happened in our past and our, in our parents' past and our grandparents' past and the, our great grandparents' past. And um, because of the way America structures this, this history, this narrative, it's like we, we carry, we carry that weight with us and it does, it, mm -hmm. and it, and it packs our, it impacts our president and, and how we, and how we move. And so yeah, I've been thinking a lot about how how do I extend that narrative? How do I keep talking about that through different projects? Yeah, because there's there's a way in which you know if we don't talk about these histories, then we don't notice when you know to go back to the um, the very intentional choice of using Tulsa, Oklahoma as the site for this rally. How yeah. the actual impact, the actual cruelty of that decision. Um, it doesn't res it won't resonate the same way if you don't know that history then you don't right. kind of see the very active machinations of you know a, this totalitarian regime you don't see the strings in the same way and so it's it seems like it's also very important for like being able to recognize um to recognize when when we're doing when we are repeating the past exactly yeah yeah this was definitely, I mean, this remains one of my favorite works of yours. Oh, thank you so definitely. much. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's a very, it's heavy. It's a very heavy piece, <laughs> but um, I think it's, I think it's critical. I think it's especially necessary um, right now. Um, so I think one of the, the, one of the other pieces I want to talk about before um, I open it up to questions is I definitely want to um, talk about your most recent mural um, on Jackson Street, you said, correct? In San Francisco? Uh, it depends on which one. I, I've done two this, this summer. It depends on okay. which, which image. Well, the one, the one um, that's on the outside of Gallery Wendy Norris. Yeah, that's on yeah. Um, Octavia. Octavia, okay. Yeah. Let me, I'm going to pull that one up and then we can talk about it. Yeah, this was through um, the the collective Hundred Days Action, 
Um, and they've been, um, I think they've been working through Root Division and with, um, with Facebook. Mm. And they, um, they had this project called um, Artists as Essential Worker. And so um, a lot of these buildings that have, um, you know, boarded up their, their storefronts, um, they've been going around and enlisting artists to populate them with their artwork. So, um, yeah, I, I feel like uh, I really didn't, I really didn't do much, but, but send them a file for this one. And so um, when I was thinking about um, what would be the, the best body of work to send them and what image I wanted to, uh, you know, I wanted to share um, that sort that reflected uh, our current times. It, you know, I chose this one from a body of work called um, Rituals of Water, where I was uh, exploring how water as a, um, as an element has been part of the yeah, African and African-American um, diaspora from transatlantic slavery through, um, at the time, Hurricane Katrina. And so um, involved me researching uh, a lot of black and white photographs and going through this process where, um, you know, my medium was really tied really closely to uh, the conceptual idea of, of water and fluidity and and th things being washed away and submerged and you know any any synonym or uh, any synonym of water you can think of i was trying to um um use that in the body of work so um so again like i said i was using some photographs that i had sourced and this is uh um, this is based this painting is based on a photograph uh, by um charles moore who was uh he has a book called powerful days um and it's all these civil rights uh um era photographs and where civil rights activists were being attacked and, and hit with water cannons and things like that. So, um, so I, I, I chose to, to re re recreate one of his photographs uh, in this painting. And all the, all the works have, um, again, some synonym of water or some uh, adjective involving water. So this one called Tipping Point uh, just has the number of, has the boiling point of water. Oh. Uh, I was I was wondering what the with the with the numbers meant. Yeah. Yeah. This I just want to say this is stunning. I have yet to see it in person. Oh, thank um, you. maybe later today as I am in the <laughs> moment, but seeing it, you know, just, you know, on the internet coming across my feed, I was arrested by this image. It's Oh, thank you. So it's just so striking and one of one of the things that I really um that this, it didn't, I, I knew there was something that I was thinking of and that was really special about it. Um, and then reading comments to, uh, you know, when the photo was posted, people commenting on, um, commenting on the post, someone made reference to uh, the raft of the Medusa and that painting. And that immediately, I was like, yes, mm -hmm. that's it. And I was wondering if that was an intentional reference that you had and just thinking about kind of the history of that painting as well. Um, and it's a kind of dubious depiction of black bodies. Um, right. I was, I'm just wondering if that, I mean, obviously you're, you source this from a photograph, but I was wondering if that is some, if that's a relationship that you've thought about at all and um, yeah, and what your thoughts are there. Oh, it is now. Um, then I'm also thinking about like um, Charles Moore when he took that photograph um, did I mean, he he couldn't have composed it because it was it was happening right. live in front of him, and you know I'm I'm assuming he had to move pretty quickly um, to capture this photograph. Um, but I wanted to did it, you know, did it as, as him as a photographer did it did it strike him as well? Um, mm -hmm. Did he make that reference? And for me, it was just I think it was probably the last probably the last painting I did in that series, um, and I think it was just, I did probably 12 paintings in that series in total. Um, and it just seemed like, you know, this was the end. This is the sort of the culmination of, of this of the series. And there's also, um, it just stood out that, you know, it, it, it almost, you know, it almost made itself. Um, yeah. And, and just the approach, I mean, the approach that I, I would take for, for all of these pieces was, um, drawing you know drawing the whole thing out lightly in pencil and then i would just sort of flood the page with with sort of ink water and salt and and i would just leave 
Oh, wow. And then when it was when it was workable enough, then I was start making decisions about what to pull out and what to mm -hmm. what to keep more abstract. How um, for the original for the original painting? What what's the size of that? Uh, forty by sixty. Wow, so still quite large. <laughs> you like working large? I've noticed. Um, yeah, if it was, uh, yeah, I had opportunity to do so. I mean. Um, you know, they were still there for me. They were still workable enough that I could work on two pieces or three pieces at a time. I could have one, two on the wall and one on my table, and just keep sort of rotating them back and forth. And I, I really enjoyed the process of uh, how each one ended up painting sort of informed the other one, especially as I, if I was working on things simultaneously. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, also the idea of um, um, I had a, a good friend of mine. Um, uh, Julia Goodman, uh, we were studio mates at the time, and I was sort of struggling with this whole idea because um, I was making these black and white, these really boring black and white paintings from really great black and white photographs. And it, there was something missing in the, in between, missing in the translation. And she sort of walked over to me and said, like, between all the materials that you have out, you're, I wasn't taking full advantage of, like, all the materials I had. And that's when I decided I wanted to have more of a... Um, a call and response with the materials, especially the paper, and also the sort of, you know, in, in evaporation in the nature and um, just sort of letting things flow. Um, no pun intended um, with the element of water, but um, just sort of letting things happen. And then like, okay, I, I can pull this out. Oh, this is really great the way this is. Oh, don't, don't touch that. And um, it became more of um, this cooperation between myself and the, and the materials. So you're always in collaboration, either with other artists, with materials, with yourself, yeah. Yeah. history, with yeah. ghosts, who knows? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I am going to turn it over to audience Q&A now. Um, I'm so glad we got to look at that, though, because it's truly, it's truly an incredible, incredible mural. Yeah, um, thanks, thanks to 100 Days Action and, and Wendy Norris. Um, they were all in when I uh, showed them that image and, um, you know, they even added a little bit more with the explanation and the text on the other on the end of it. And, and yeah, they just really took care of me with that piece. Okay, so the first question that we have is, what inspired the use of screen printing over any other method to create? Um, I was working on a body work called Fact and Fiction and um, and just really, really short, um, trying to bridge that gap between um, the preciousness that people have for, um, you know, fictional characters and fictional stories versus how sometimes we ignore like the really tragic events that are, that are, that are sort of going on next to us. And so um, I started using um, fiction based literature, um, parts of that literature in combination with um, portraits of individuals whose sort of histories have been sort of lost so to sort of re-examine re um, and uh, make a more nuanced connection to what they're what they're going through. So, um, yeah, um, I went through a, different, a bunch of different iterations. Um, I was actually using those books that it came from, and like drawing inside the books and making cuts inside these books. And um, you know, I get I just kept being more and more attracted to um, the printed media, like. So there's the, you know, there's a printed, there's the printed word, obviously from these books, but also that printed minute, that printed image. And um, then I found out, uh, you know, just by playing Photoshop that I could, um, I can almost paint and draw like I would uh, normally on a, on a sheet of paper or, or, or a piece of canvas in, in, in Photoshop by using different filters. And um, that way I felt like my hand was still in it, even though it's a digital hand, my hand is still in it. And so um, being able to output that process um, you know, I just realized it was just another extension of, you know, my drawing technique. Um, cause when I'm printing these things, I'm, you know, I'm not trying to make this perfect edition. Um, um, I've, I've, I've editioned some of those portraits, but, um, that was never really the real goal for me. It was just another extension of, of mark making. And that's probably what got me into, uh, I have a background in printmaking anyway. And I think that's what got me into printmaking was like, oh, this is, this is another cool way for me to draw. Yeah. I think that moves us into the next question, which is um, Aisha says, Rodney, I love the combination of text and image. 
so well balanced, which comes first in your practice? Um, it depends. Um, I know definitely for the fact and fiction stuff that sometimes I would have that, that body of text that, I, that, um, that I wanted to use and had to really think about um, what, what image I wanted to pair it with. Um, and sometimes it was reversed. Sometimes I would, you know, I had that image of a child soldier, like what is the best piece of text? What is the, what is something that, what is a comparison or a parallel that I can make through literature? And for me, it was a, a section from the Lord of the Flies. So um, sometimes it, it takes, yeah, none of them were like immediate decisions. Um, I mean, that project went from 2000 and, 12 to like 2016 till I, you know, till I finally showed that body of work. Um, so yeah, um, strangely enough, I, I, I like to do a lot of research. Um, and it's really important to me to like, when I'm using that combination of image and text to use it in a way that's um, communicating ideas to the to a viewer and also um, creating a dialogue between the piece of artwork and the viewer. So um, I, I think I'm always trying to push the work away from me in a good way, like make it larger than, than, than who I am. So like, mm. yeah, there's an element of craft that's always involved in it that, that I respect, but, um, but it's, 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 I'm only trying to use it to support those ideas. The next question, um, is, um, is pain in some form necessary for the creation of art? Pain. It's a big question, but. I, I guess it depends on who you ask. Like, um, <laughs> Is it necessary? No, no, no. Uh, uh, the, the, the first mural I did this summer, um, uh, it was a private commission for this, this family on, on Jackson Street. And, and I knew I wanted to use the text from um, release by Saul Williams that's on an old Black Delicious album. And, um, and, I, and I, have this, I have this practice where, um, where I'm using text and I'm, I'm, I'm doing it one letter at a time through stencils and I'm using graphite and I'm making these whole pieces of work and, and, and it's, it's, it's labor intensive. Then I was gonna do that on this wall and at some point I looked at it and it's like, nah. <laughs> nah, you're not gonna, <laughs> you're gonna be sitting here for three weeks going with letter by letter up on a ladder, um, killing your back, killing my back, uh, out in the hot sun, uh, you know, for extended periods of time. Like this is not necessary. Let's go cut. Let's go have some stencils cut. Let's go have some things laser cut for you. And um, so, no, it's not necessary. It's not not that not that kind of physical pain. Um, especially as I get older. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of work smarter, not harder. But um, but I think that hard work shows up in other areas because it's, it's, a, it's a longer process. There's like, I go through a lot of iterations of like how to, how to get things done. Um, and sometimes I can't figure them out right away. So I have to sit with them and maybe that could be seen as pain, but, mm -hmm. um, but no, I don't think, uh, I don't think it's necessary. I, sometimes I think that um, depending on what you're trying to do, what you're trying to achieve, um, if you're, if you're thinking about like, you know, if you're thinking about what's the best way to communicate ideas to, to your audience and I, which I quite often do and it. So I do, it means I don't always stick with the same medium every time. And, you know, I guess that that pain sort of pushes you to do, to do better. Oh, yeah. It's a really poetic way of, of summing that up, I think. <laughs> Um, okay, so we have uh, about three more questions left. Um, so we're going to go over a little bit, but um, I think they're going to be good questions. Um, so the next one is, would you say part of your work is a type of preservation of African American historical narrative? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I grew up uh, going to school like late 60s, 70s and 80s. And those textbooks that were presented to me and a lot of my friends were just inadequate. Just put it just put it bluntly. Um, they skipped over and edited our history and and kept putting us in the same stereotypical sections in you know which are either entertainment or sports or slavery every time, and with no nuanced contributions or um, you know as part of our history. So 
um, my parents and my friends' parents were um, always making sure that, that we knew our history. And my mother, like, I remember walking through the door and like, you know, she's like, here, you need to read this, you know, and, or they were, you know, they had their own form of, uh, of storytelling, which, which, which involved our history, not only our family history, but histories of, histories of, of Black people in America. And yeah, I think that really sat with me. Um, and the older I got and the less, less, the less I saw of our representation in, in history books and in areas of science and literature or other areas of culture, um, the more it made me sort of look for these things and, and, and find these narratives and, and, and also ask why, why are we missing? Like, why didn't I grow up with the, the history of the, the women at NASA in, in, Higgins, yeah. in Higgins figures? Like, um, you know, I had explained to my students why I was so angry about that. They're like, but isn't this a great movie? Like, yeah, it's a great movie, but I didn't grow up with this history. So, is, for, so as a follow-up question to that question, is that also part of the ethos you take into teaching as well in your in your practice, but also in sort of how you see yourself as an educator? I mean, I'm lucky enough to be, I got a job in the art department at San Francisco Day School um, that was started by um, Karen Richards, who, you know, we study a different artist every month. Mm -hmm. And that ethos has really, it's, it's, it's been, it's been a lifesaver for me in the sense that my art practice and my, my teaching practice around that hasn't been that much. There's not that much different. I see them as the same thing. And, and through this art of the month practice, you know, we, you know, put it bluntly, um, we did a, um, we did a presentation presentation at um, at a conference a year ago, and um, in in our pamphlets it says you know quite bluntly you know we don't study dead white we don't study dead white men, period. And so we're really interested in um, educating the kids that all the different places that art can come from and mm -hmm. who makes it and and it's not always the populated by European white males. Um, yeah. And you know we we study local artists, we study artists that are on the national scene, but we make sure that um, that we we truly have a diversity in our program, and we have a lot of we have a lot of windows and mirrors, so mm -hmm. kids can look out and see um, different types of artists, and then they can see art different types of artists reflected reflected back at them that look like them. Yeah. All right. So the next question is, how does site specificity play into your concepts, both in public mural work and beyond? Mm, that's, ooh, that's a hard question. Um, yeah, it's, it's always different. I know there was one point when I was at the Headlands last year and I was making these, these three foot by three foot children's blocks and I made the first one and I brought it up from the wood shop up to my to my uh to the project space and i was looking at it i'm like oh this thing is too big like i gotta make two more of these which is like physically is like like i understand it uh, the math and the craftsmanship that goes in, involved in it but i thought like oh this is too overwhelmed for people it needs to be much smaller and then uh cory newkirk who who was in the other space comes comes down a hallway and he's looking at me like what are you doing like you know was, you know i had at this point i had a hammer and a screwdriver in my hand i was about to take it apart he's like no you, like how many more of these are you gonna make i'm like i have two more it's like Look at the space, it's a perfect space for it. And that's when I started thinking about, you know, um, embracing the idea of installation and how um, scale can really uh, impact the viewer and how, they, and how they read the work. So yeah, that made sense to me. Um, and then some things just need to be smaller and intimate. Um, did a series of drawings um, based on, um, based on the uh, black men and women who, who have been murdered by the police or by civilian authority or by civilians. And, you know, those things are only nine by 12 and they're on slate boards. And there's something about, you know, the preciousness of those and they, they look kind of old and um, that you can approach them. So yeah, some t you know, just like some things need to be works on paper and some things need to be installation. Some things need that, that, move, that, that room to move around physically and some things need that, that room to move around a little bit more intimately. Mm -hmm. 
the last question is um, ba uh, basically is uh, love the collaboration with T.D. Pearson as well. Will these works be exhibited? Yeah. Um, Another plug, please. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, again, um, the space program, um, residency, um, the principals there um, have been, been really good to us. And like I said, Jed, Jed Bergeron, uh, one of the principals there, um, he shows with Nancy Toomey and um, yeah, he's been in talks with her. She's really interested in showing the work um, next spring. So hopefully, um, hopefully that's uh, something that actually takes place physically in our gallery and people can see it. Excellent. Well, I want to thank you, Rodney, for taking the time to talk with us today, with me mostly, but also with our <laughs> audience members. No, thank you for having us. Lynn, it's always great talking to you. I, I always have fun. Yeah. It's, and I hope that we will get to see one another in person one day again, maybe in 2059, yes. but, uh, <laughs> but hopefully, hopefully we will. Um, and I want to thank everyone in the audience for attending today's um, In the Artist Studio. There will be another one next week, same time, 1 p.m. Um, and be sure to check out all of our additional programming later in the week and any past programs um, via the MOAD YouTube channel. Um, so it's been great. Uh, I will let you all go.